Welcome everybody and thank you for joining us today uh, in our meaningful discussion and a glimpse into postpartum care. We have some really awesome providers here um, today to share their expertise with us and answer some questions that were submitted from attendees, um, pre-submitted, and there are so many great questions that came in. Um, I wish we had hours to answer everything um, and to give you all the information that you need, um, but I still hope that even though we won't be able to get to every single question, there will be a lot of meaningful information and education for you here today. Um, and we're also glad that you are interested in being here and learning. Um, I am Dr. Kathy Yoon Kayani, uh, go by Dr. Kat. I'm a private practice uh, psychologist and I specialize in perinatal mental health. And um, I, right now, as most of us do, run my practice online. Um, I am a board member for Postpartum Support International and I host the Mom and Mind podcast. Um, and I came to this profession by way of personal experience, or the specialty rather, um, of going through some of my own postpartum and mental health changes. Uh, with that, I'm grateful that you guys are here to learn um, and hopefully get some good information to take back to your practices and into your life. Um, I'm really happy to have you here and I'm going to have our speakers introduce themselves. We have Crystal Cargis and Annie Frisbee and Sherry Nafta who are going to um, share with us uh, their expertise. Um, so Sherry, can you please start and let us know a little bit about yourself? College is ahead of time. My internet is not doing how to turn my camera off. Sherry Nafta, I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. My practice is in Beverly Hills. I think we'll have to come back to Sherry um, um, and hear a little bit more. Okay, oh, come on. Okay, great. Um, Crystal. Hi, thank you, Dr. Kat. I am Crystal Cargis. I'm a registered dietitian and board certified lactation consultant, and also a mama of five kiddos. Um, and also, like Dr. Kat, my experience with postpartum depression after my first three children was, but has to specialize in perinatal health for women and also um, just to support them through the transition into motherhood because there's so many different factors and things that are happening at this time. And so I'm just really happy, really passionate about supporting moms um, and building a relationship with food and their bodies that supports them through motherhood. So I'm glad to be here. Great, thank you, Crystal. Annie. Hi, I'm Annie Frisbee. I'm a board certified lactation consultant. I am in private practice in New York City. And uh, pre COVID, I was exclusively doing home visits for lactation support. And now I'm exclusively doing virtual visits and hoping to return to in person at some point soon. And um, I have a real passion for um, perinatal mood disorders and supporting families, um, seeing how effective the right interventions can be in really getting families on track so that these parents can enjoy their babies because that's really what it's all about. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, so if Sherry comes back, we'll hear a little bit more from her. Um, so let's dig in to our questions and um, I'll be your facilitator and popping in where I can um, with some, uh, some answers as well. Um, question number one that came in, what is the importance of treating perinatal and postpartum issues with an interdisciplinary team? And I think we all have great perspectives on this. Um, Annie, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think um, it's the only way to take care of these issues. And so for me as a lactation consultant, I don't have a medical license. So I'm an allied health professional. I'm meant to work within a team. And that's really foundational to the work that IBCLCs do is connecting the different care providers. And often because I'm in someone's home, either in person or virtually, I'm seeing things that don't get revealed in an office setting during a well child visit or the six week postpartum visit. And often in the course of sharing with me what's going on with breastfeeding or not going on with breastfeeding they're revealing all kinds of other things and and i've learned through the years where i need to say to these families i am not the person for this but i would love to help you find the person who can help you with this and it's it's i mean it's an honor to be with these families but it is certainly a burden too heavy for 
someone to carry alone, especially without the license or training to actually do the work that needs to be done with them. Absolutely. Um, Crystal, what are your thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. Just to echo what we are encountering um, are very complex and layered. There's so many different things that are happening in their lives. And I think as ally, an allied health professional too, that we may have an angle that we're seeing that maybe other professionals are not seeing. And same here, like I see a lot of things in my nutrition practice that may not get seen when you know, our moms are seeing their OBGYN or their midwife. And so collectively, when we can combine our expertise together, we can really help address the multi, you know, factors that are happening for new moms as they enter this season of pregnancy and postpartum. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Ms. Sherry, are you with us? Has Sherry come back? Okay. Um, Right, so from a mental health perspective, certainly um, when I'm meeting with uh, clients in the office, I'm getting you know, to sit with people for hours, um, one hour at a time, um, and seeing just a slice of their experience and what they're feeling. And in, in all of the collaboration that I've ever done with other providers, it has, it, including lactation consultants, nurse practitioners, um, OBs, I get more information and more pieces of the puzzle that can really help um, strengthen and improve a treatment plan, goals for that particular client, um, especially when they know there are multiple providers working together on their behalf, um, that it, it contributes to the, the feelings for them that they are not alone. Um, and because our systems have been so siloed in the past and you know, when you go to your physician, that's what they take care of. And you go to your OB, that's what they take care of. When we can integrate them, um, the, the overall care for the patient and the client is just way better. Um, and I know that their providers are, are all on the same page. Yeah. Um, any other thoughts for this question? Is Sherry there? Okay, um, moving along to question number two. Um, what research do we have on the correlation between breastfeeding and depression? Um, Crystal, would you like to start with this one? Sure, absolutely. This is such a great question. So the things that, that I've seen in my work, but also from the literature is that there are a couple of different things. So one, um, unresolved pain issues can be a trigger for depression and just feelings of failure. And um, I think sometimes moms idea of understanding that breastfeeding is supposed to be painful and so they don't really reach out for help they don't ask about it and they just try to push through it but really that unresolved pain that's associated with breastfeeding um, can absolutely be a trigger and a risk factor for postpartum depression the other thing that i see from the literature and also in my practice is the correlation between poor body image and um breastfeeding and also postpartum depression. So sometimes if a mom has you know, a history of trauma or even birth trauma, um, you know, she can have more issues with breastfeeding and just getting that off successfully. And then that can all be interlinked into, you know, risk factors for depression. Sure, thank you. Um, Annie, what have you experienced? Yeah, I mean, every definitely everything Crystal just said. and. Also kind of adding the unique uh, cultural position that like our American families are in, which is th these families are being told that breastfeeding is a choice and that that becomes success or failure. So this has become something not that is an inherent biological right and part of the natural reproductive process, but it's something that you're opting into that you can, that you have to make happen. And so when that's the case, there's so much tied up in its success or its failure when really, um, and I, I'm, this is not an original thought to me and people can read a book called The Big Letdown by Kimberly Seals Allers to learn more about this idea, which is people don't breastfeed, communities breastfeed, cultures breastfeed. And when a, a family cannot breastfeed, that family was failed by the system there's no place in there where any individual fails. And that is a message that is not getting through to families. It's certainly not getting through to them in marketing about around infant feeding. 
And that, I think that really gets minimized a lot by, um, you know, just kind of in that space where people are sharing their breastfeeding troubles, when people just say, well, just don't feel guilty. All you have to do is not feel guilty. And you, when your body isn't working the way it's supposed to work, that's so much more than, than guilt and success. Sure, absolutely. Um, yeah, and I, I have also seen in, in some research that um, people who want to breastfeed but can't for any number of reasons uh, are uh, tend more to depression. Um, and people who don't want to breastfeed but either feel pressured or feel like they have to, um, and it wasn't something in line with what their plan was, um, also are, are tend more towards depression. Um, so to and to your point, Annie, it becomes so individualized um, that there it's like a personal failure if they can't or don't want to, um, that it becomes like very internalized and like a personal problem. But I, I agree, it's a it's a community problem. Really, really great. Um, all right, moving to question three. How do you respond to women who develop anxiety and depression from their breastfeeding experience or lactation failure? Annie, um, what have you seen there? Yeah, I mean, I've had the, the honor to support a lot of women who have been ex going, experiencing diagnosed postpartum anxiety or postpartum depression and walking through that with them through their, their breastfeeding journey and the ups and downs. And what I have seen is the importance of having, of really having that help separated but working together. So we need the mental health professional to be addressing the mental health issue. But one thing that I, I've found that can be really harmful is when the, I mean, I'm sure this ha you know happens both ways. So I'm not going to say I'm not saying it's one way or the other. But when the mental health professional, in all the best best meaning ways starts giving breastfeeding advice and infant feeding advice, which is really common. And I mean, lactation consultants, and we teach about this, like don't step outside your scope. You, you're not a therapist unless you are a therapist. And so it is super important for the, fam the parent to know, I talked to my lactation consultant about feeding and nutrition and, by and what's going on with my body. And I talked to my therapist about what's going on with my feelings and that the therapist and the lactation consultant are in communication with each other so that no the parent isn't getting conflicting messages about feeding i had one one client who was dealing with a pretty pretty ex, very ex, uh intense case and i was emailing regularly with the therapist just kind of staying in the loop okay like watching her ups and downs and just and then the therapist giving me things to say to her and me telling the therapist here's how to support her with her feeding goals and it was i mean it was beautiful to see it work that way and i know she she felt like you were saying dr cat just that web of of support um and how meaningful that was to her i wish everybody could have that sure yeah um crystal do you have any thoughts on that too yeah, just to add to that, I think it's important for women to be reminded that there's not a one size fits all to feeding, to your postpartum journey, to your healing experience, and that, yes, as professionals, we exist to help support a woman's unique needs and her unique journey and healing experience. And, you know, I, I think help women identify like what that failure means, what it represents to them, um, and also just reminding them of the big picture that that they're coming into here, that sometimes, you know, mental health has to be a priority. And if breastfeeding has been triggering to that for any reason, we want to help support her and, and help her work through that so that, you know, she's looking at herself holistically, not just, you know, I'm supposed to breastfeed and compartmentalizing herself as a mother. She's a whole person. And again, like, you know, just affirming what Annie has shared too. I think this is such a beautiful way that we can collectively work together and reach out across the aisle as providers to support these women. Because as you can see from issues like this, it's a very complex thing. It's not just the lactation issue. It's not mental health, like they're overlapping. And I think supporting her through that is really important. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you for that. Um, next, um, how can we best support mothers during COVID-19 where mothers may not have access to the care or help they typically would receive? Um, Crystal, what are you seeing in your practice? Yeah, this is such a good question. I feel like it's, it's ongoing, it's evolving. 
Um, but yeah, I think getting really creative with the virtual support and resources that we have, and I know it's not ideal because it's you know, not in person, especially for things like lactation visits. I think having that in-person connection, um, a lot of moms that, you know, in-person support groups and connect in person with other mothers may really feel like they're lacking that right now. And I think um, trying to utilize the virtual resources that we have as best as possible and re helping remind them that they're still connected to other women, even if it's not in the ideal in-person situation that we would prefer. Okay, great. Um, uh, so Annie, um, yeah, what, what are you doing um, and what are you seeing that's helpful and supportive? Yeah, I mean, I think um, the virtual visits have their limitations, but I, I do think um, there's, there's certain problems that these families have that nobody can solve. So here in New York City, it's, I mean, people are trapped inside studio or one bedroom apartments with a new baby. And, and for that, for me, sometimes I feel like the only thing I can say is there's nothing right about what you're going through right now. Like this is not how it's supposed to be. And I'll, and then to kind of contextualize it and say, even under the best of circumstances, if you were having no feeding problems, you would still need help. You're not supposed to do this without help. And I'm really sorry you can't get the help that you need because you should have it. And so I can offer that empathy. I don't have a solution attached to it, but just to say, you know, let's just, I'm here for you to talk to you about your baby and what's happening. Um, and I'll try to help you get what you need, but just to affirm that their feelings have nothing to do with their adequacy as a parent and have everything to do with the fact that they're, they had a baby during a pandemic and that was never in their plan. Right, 100%. Yeah, I, I feel like I'm doing those kinds of things too. There's a lot of normalizing that we have to do and validating like, you know, as as much as possible. Um, because nobody knows, really, we know, no one who's alive anyways has ever dealt with this um, before. And we're, we're all trying to figure it out. Um, and I think, it, you know, it's, it's hard, especially for first time um, parents to for everything to be new already and then not having um, a, a, a soft place to land, a place that feels like, yes, this is to rely on a plan, especially for people who are feeling anxious um, and want to try and manage and, and control as much as they can. Um, there is just so much that feels um, out of control. Uh, so getting creative about what, well, what can we use? Um, you know, there, there's a, a lot of time there where there was concern with uh, for people who are pregnant um, about if they would be able to have their partner um, in there to deliver and, or a doula or anybody. Um, and, and there's been a little bit of progress. Now mostly partners can go in, but still it's not, um, you know, it's a lot of grief. Um, uh, like just acknowledging the grief of that this, this isn't what I planned for. This isn't really um, what I wanted. Uh, and that's not to say that people don't have a fine experience. Certainly people are having decent and good experiences. Um, but uh, we've had to get creative. You know, how, how can, can you call in a partner? Can you call in a doula and have somebody there with you virtually? Um, and how can you use your online resources? Um, do you feel safe with having a meal train? People still coming through and dropping meals off? Um, and really exploring what they're comfortable with and what their needs are and are there creative ways to still help uh, help them meet their mental, emotional, and physical needs. Um, and, and certainly if, if somebody's meeting with me, they're at a place where they're already having a hard time and they're already, um, you know, they've come to a, a therapist because things aren't going well. Um, so sometimes that's really like pulling in partners and family members and other people um, who can either help check on them, um, help with chores, um, help explain for them on their behalf to partner like this, this is what's going on for them and it's hard for them to even be able to um, uh, conceptualize it or talk about it. Um, so yeah, in, in any way, uh, we've had to get very creative uh, with how to access a care um, in virtual spaces. Um, and sometimes it's helpful and sometimes it's not. And, and that is really, really challenging to sit with that reality. 
um, but the more that we can normalize and, and um, get creative and be there with them, um, the, the less alone they feel. All right, um, question number five. Uh, what are some considerations for Black moms given the disparities in maternal deaths and postpartum care? Um, thank you for that question, and it is a, a big question um, and an important question and a necessary one, um, and really like deserves its own <laughs> its its own call. Um, some of the things that I'd like to say first is that there there are a lot of organizations and individuals really working hard to um, to fix and to um, heal these disparities. It's a it's a deep deep uh, issue um, and problem. Um, uh, but some right now, so some of the options are setting up your village, setting up your care team um, to, with people, uh, if they're accessible to you, with people who understand um, the, the current um, difficulties uh, and challenges related to maternal mortality and infant mortality and for Black women um, and for women of color. Um, and there are a lot of, well, I'm going to give you several resources to point to, and we, we can put this in a list for you guys to have later. Um, but finding um, a, a doula or a midwife or a lactation consultant who, or therapist for that matter, um, who understands these, um, these dynamics, um, it can be really helpful. You, having an advocate in your corner, having somebody who understands how the system um, don't work um, and and work how they function rather um, is is very helpful. So there are um, I would I, I would start looking for resources and support um, even community and community um, through organizations like Black Mamas Matter Alliance, um, Uzazi Village, um, Black Women Birthing Justice, um, Perinatal Mental Health Alliance for People of Color, um, Shades of Blue Project. Um, and um, system midwife, uh, frontline doulas. There are so many organizations that are doing this work that you can you can call, you can ask them um, what are good resources for me. Do you have resources that are available? Um, and oh, uh, some resources are sliding scale. Um, and uh, so ha having a team is really really uh, useful. Um, one other. Point that I think is important um, is because of, and again, this is a huge, huge topic, but in part because of um, racism, structural uh, racism and implicit bias, um, a lot of women, Black women in particular, um, and women of color don't feel heard uh, when they come to a provider with a, a pain or um, a, a problem or something that they're concerned about. Um, so. It, and it can be really hard to continue to push for what you need um, and you know for your care and what your intuition and what your body is telling you. Um, and also being consistent and persistent is really important. Um, that one suggestion is that if you have a really deep need for your provider to, to do what you're asking or to pay attention to something and they deny that, then ask them to put it in your chart that they've denied your request um, and um, let, let it be known in, in the chart, in the system, that what you needed was not addressed. Um, it may or may not change what happens in the moment, but it, um, it's, a, it's, uh, for not, it's not easy for everybody to do, but it's sometimes, especially if you have somebody helping you, um, it can be a useful way um, to have somebody to listen. Um, and given that, like, if you have a provider that you don't feel um, heard by, or that they're, you're not listening, they're not listening to you. Um, if you can find another provider. Um, so I'll leave, it's a big question, but for now, um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, and Annie or Crystal, do you have anything to add to that for now? I'll just add a reminder that the end of the month is Black Breastfeeding Week, so we're in Black Breastfeeding, we're in World Breastfeeding Month right now, um, and there's World Breastfeeding Week. There is Native Breastfeeding. Feeding which native breastfeeding week, which starts on Monday, and then supporting infant feeding in emergencies is the week after that. And then the last week of the month is Black Breastfeeding Week. And 
to really use that as a time to find local organizations that you can donate money to who are doing the work and want funding. They may not want you, if you're a person with white presenting privilege, they may not want you at their event or helping, but they would they probably would want your money and it can go a long way. So um, that's a great opportunity. It comes around once a year um, to really just focus on the importance of supporting breastfeeding among black mothers. Great, thank you. Um, okay. Uh, oh, sorry, I was gonna add something really quickly, uh -huh. sorry. Yeah. Um, I just wanna say to, as a provider, I think it's so helpful to continue to do the education and the work for ourselves. I think we need to keep doing that to advocate for the black women that we may work with in our practice and to be better allies to them through the work that we're doing. It has to start with us. And so I just wanted to mention one quick resource that has been really helpful for me, and that is Mom Congress is actually doing a lot of work um, to you know look at the legislative things that can be pushed to advocate for better um, maternal health care for our black community. And I think that's something that has really helped me as a provider, you know, as a reminder, like there's so much work has to be done. Um, and yeah, it starts with us. Great, thank you. Um, okay, um, question six, how can we best support the destigmatization based around the idea of breast is best? Um, Annie, would you like to start with this one? Sure, yeah, I mean, I, I am not a fan of the phrase breast is best. I'm also really not a fan of the phrase fed is best. I think that is both of those things sort of really make infant feeding and lactation into this really small thing when in fact it's it's part of your identity and who you are. And I think moving away from this message that any any parent is trying to do what's best for their baby, let's just start and erase that nobody nobody needs to do best there is no best nobody's grading you there's no there's no race there's no finish line you're trying to live your life and build a family identity and enjoy the person who just came to live with you and get to know them and and see who they are and also find out who you are in this new role and i think that a great step towards towards getting away from this breast is best and removing the stigma is to have a bigger inclusive vision of what is happening with lactation and infant feeding. So recognizing that it's not breast because pumping is breastfeeding. Parents who are whose baby's mouths never touch their nipples are breastfeeding when they are feeding their babies their milk. Babies who are getting donor milk, either formally or informally, are breastfed. They're getting fed by humans human milk for human, you know, this is what it really comes down to. And then seeing families be supported in their own biological needs, which also begins with recognizing too, that not all lactating people identify as women or mothers, that there are fathers who breastfeed. And, and chest feeding is a word that we need to get really comfortable using. That we're really, what we're talking about is health and wellness at a much bigger level than just the X number of months that nobody can, you know, the AAP and the World Health Organization can't get on the same page about how many months it should be. It shouldn't matter because this is about building a life, creating health, and making strong families. Beautiful, thank you. Yeah. Um, Crystal, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I love what Annie, Annie shared. She said it so well, and I think it, it's really about focus on the big encompassing picture and we want to help mothers um, and families make decisions that are best supporting them and moving towards this big picture goal you know and I really like to look at infant feeding too as a, a relationship between parents and their babies and how can we nurture that relationship in a way that's best supportive of not just baby but also mom and coming together supporting them in finding out what the individual approach is and like Annie mentioned there's so many different ways that we can nurture a feeding relationship between the caregiver and the infant. It's it's not just breastfeeding. There's so many other aspects. And I think the way we de destigmatize that is I'm speaking out of different ways and reminding moms that there's so many different factors to consider. And she can, at the end of the day, do what works best for her family. Yeah, absolutely. 
um, on the on the mental health side of this, the the effects of the stigma are pretty massive. Um, and you know, I I see a lot of shame and guilt um, around the idea of what people are supposed supposed to do um, and then what um, happens uh, and uh, like if we can do what you guys are saying and reduce the stigma and and normalize all feeding and um, like you were saying so beautifully um, Annie did, did that it's about building the family um, then the pressure isn't all on this one person to you know to do every, like you know to essentially keep the, the baby alive it becomes a huge mental stress and strain to feel like they're feeling if they're not doing um, meeting the the catchphrase, um, like living up to the catchphrase. It's really really tough. Um, okay, anything else to add for that? Great. Um, all right, number seven. Um, do mothers who have counseling prior to giving birth have a lower rate of postpartum depression? Um, what I can say uh, about this is that we know that prevention helps. Um, and we also know that sometimes depression and anxiety start in pregnancy. Um, and because unless it's like more moderate or severe symptoms, sometimes people will, will feel like it's just, I'm just hormonal or, um, you know, this is just because I'm pregnant and kind of minimize a little bit of the, the depth of the feelings that they're having. Um, so certainly um, I have a huge bias that everybody should go to therapy. Um, but certainly um, in the reproductive period of time, going through fertility challenges or trying to conceive, um, absolutely pregnancy can help um, prevent, um, not totally prevent sometimes, but it can help minimize the, the intensity of symptoms. You can come up with a plan uh, for a loose plan on how to manage. Uh, I'm not talking about birth plan. I'm talking about a postpartum care plan. Um, how are you going to be working with your um, your partner, your family, whoever is involved um, to make sure that you're getting adequate rest and nutrition and support so that the, all those stressors are minimized and therefore you can minimize uh, the, the chances and or intensity of uh, postpartum depression. Um, uh, so, um, and that's also like for, a lot of stuff comes up for people when um, that kind of a, can be really unexpected when they are uh, entering into the reproductive phase of their life, stuff that they didn't expect to be thinking about or feeling. Um, and so having a trained therapist, someone who's trained in perinatal mental health and understands these dynamics um, is really important to help um, reduce the intensity, understand where the feelings are coming from. And as I said before, um, set up a, a plan of support and care for um, the postpartum period. So to that end, yes, it can um, help lower the rate. I can't give you statistics on that, um, but I, I can tell you that I've seen it time and time again. Is that anything you would like to add, Annie or Crystal? Yeah, I'll add something briefly just from my perspective. I work with a lot of women who have eating disorders or who have had a history of an eating disorder. And I think one thing that can be helpful for us as providers, whatever area you're working in, is to understand the risk factors of postpartum depression. Um, and, you know, like a history of an eating disorder or mental illness is a risk for postpartum depression. Having a history of trauma, that's going to be a risk factor for postpartum depression. So while we, again, we can't necessarily prevent it from happening, but I think identifying some of those risk factors early on in our practice, where whatever capacity we are working with these others can help us advocate for them or lead them to resources that can, you know, again, help decrease the risk factor early on. Because like Dr. Kat was saying, a lot of these things will surface in pregnancy, you know, early on in pregnancy. And I think some women are already experiencing some of the symptoms and, you know, however we can help to identify some of the risk factors and point towards resources that can help, you know, create that intervention early on, I think is always helpful in terms of preventative care. Yeah, and I'd love to add that um, the there's research that shows that the very act of screening is preventive and is an intervention in itself. And so the trainings um, that I've done for, um, I, there's one that um, I've done recently called mental health, mental health first aid for the perinatal 
uh, and birth workers. So for lactation consultants and doulas and um, talking about just screen at every time you see them, just, just keep screening, don't stop screening, but also know what to do. If you, if the screening returns something, you need to have your referral system in place. And I think, you know, having us just have the, just the, the, this is just what we do. Let's just normalize screening you because I care about you. And that really, again, creates what we were talking about earlier, that web of support where people feel like they're, they're getting looked after. 100%. Yes. Thank you. Um, all right. Um, so next question. Uh, are antidepressants allowed when mothers are breastfeeding? And does this uh, affect the growth or nutrition of the child? Uh, Crystal, would you like to start? Sure, yeah, and you know, this is a very complex question because I think it really depends on the individual. But generally, what the literature shows is that there are certain medications and antidepressants that are safe during pregnancy and postpartum and absolutely can be utilized to help support a mom's mental health and well being, um, you know, without any detriment to her baby. And I think, again, this can be a huge issue in terms of stigma that a lot of moms are facing, just wondering, like, you know, I've worked with so many moms who just go off their medication on their own, like cold turkey without any advice from their physician because they just are so scared and nervous that it's going to hurt their baby. And I just we really have to rally around them and, you know, show them the right support and resources to help them make a decision, a, a decision that best supports their situation and making sure they're getting really good comprehensive care. And I think this is where as providers and allied health professionals, we can again reach out across the aisle, connect with the OBGYN or the midwife, um, so we can work together to help come up with a plan that best helps mom during this time. Thank you. Um, Annie. Yeah, I mean, everything Crystal just said, and just to help um, parents see ownership, that the ownership is theirs, that, you know, if your doctor is telling you, you can't breastfeed on this medication to help equip them with questions to ask back, which is, is there an alternative med medication? Or what are you seeing that says that this is not safe for breastfeeding? What kind, you know, where where is this information coming from? And just to, to tell them that they don't, they can ask back what that means. And, um, and to know that for there are medications that are contraindicated while breastfeeding and don't you know you may if you have a you know certain mental illnesses you may have to choose between feeding your baby your milk and taking the medication that's going to keep you alive and we want to keep you alive top level priority but there's also there's access to human donor milk your baby could still get human milk it doesn't mean you're choosing you know you're you're not limiting your baby's nutrition in that way um and and just to say there are alternatives like for most of the medications very few cases where you are going to have to make that hard choice um but make the hard choice pick your please pick yourself <laughs> um yeah certainly and um what i see a lot uh in my practice is uh, similar to what you were saying crystal either the person not just thinking that they can't be on medications um, or their provider saying that they can't be on medications and kind of taking that at, at face value. Um, but what we do know, certainly if you are stopping medications, cold turkey um, and SSRI or an antidepressant, you can have rebound symptoms. Um, typically, you know, I'm not a psychiatrist, so I can't advise anything, but typically it's, it's suggested by psychiatrists and physicians to, to taper um, off of these medications and if they're going to. Um, but um, also to Annie's point, sometimes the the, the choice that um, people are, are having to make is is can I get through the day? Can I function? Can I can I can I be in my life? Um, uh, or should I be choosing breastfeeding? And and I think in part because we live in a world where it's just so much about um, everything for the need for the baby comes first. It's assumed that. Um, whatever whatever they need is something that we have to sacrifice and it's not understood quite fully yet that our wellness is tied to their wellness and um so um to that end there are there are several websites where you can look at um you know risks to certain medications and certainly there are um psychiatrists who are reproductive psychiatrists who are highly trained in this area 
and can give you a lot of information on um, the, the relative safety of, of medications. Um, also, again, taking into consideration your safety and your wellness. Um, and there are pop popping up all over um, um, uh, hotlines or call lines where you can call and get consultations from reproductive psychiatrists. Um, that you can like, as, a, as somebody who is seeking services, you can hand this number to your OB or um, to your um, general physician and they can call and get a free consultation um, like through Postpartum Support International. And there are a couple of others popping up here and there. Um, so you, you don't have to figure it out on your own. Um, there, are, there are people who do this for a living and figure this out and you can consult with them too. Um, okie doke. Let's see. Our next question. Um, what techniques are most effective for moms struggling with body image issues? Yeah, this is such a great question where I think really having that multidisciplinary approach is so helpful because I think it, you know, it really is a lot of working through. You know, I think it's important first to recognize that there's many different layers to body image. I think sometimes body image can come across as something that seems superficial, but remembering that for a lot of postpartum women, um, the stress that they're feeling in their body is very symbolic of the deeper distress that they may be feeling of all the different changes happening in their life as they transition through pregnancy and postpartum. And so we definitely want to first normal, you know, validate and normalize what they're going through, create a safe space for them to process. For a lot of women, um, the changes that they're feeling in their body is also grief, you know, like they're, they're letting go of a time and a body that was for be now they're adapting to this new body and so a lot of complexities there too and one thing that I have seen in my practice as well is the connection between um, trauma during pregnancy or birth or postpartum that can make it very hard for a mom to live in her body where she kind of disassociates from herself and I think that is something just to be aware of too that that's a very complex issue that warrants the help and support of a counselor, a mental health professional that can help her heal from the deeper issues that are influencing the discomfort she's feeling in her body. Thank you, Crystal. Annie? I think being mindful of our language when working with these families can really go a long way. So, um, for example, um, you, not staying away from words like, like when you're in counseling, sending words like obese or overweight and just talking about the size of your body. The size of your body is what it is. We're going to, and, and then, so like when I'm helping a family with positioning and adjustment, not saying, well, because you're larger, larger than what? Larger than who? The Duchess of Windsor or whoever that, you know, those like one of those skinny ladies that, that breastfeeds without a problem, you know? No, like you're in your body. So I'm going to help you get comfortable. And I'm not, I'm really trying to be very careful about the words that I use and trying not to use comparison words that would posit some thin white woman as normal and everybody else is not that. And that's not the case. And, um, you know, I, and, and I mean, the media to also being upfront with, with families about what they're seeing um, in the, on Instagram, really, which is um, unrealistic expectations for your body that you're supposed to lose all of your baby weight by week four and have a freezer full of expressed milk to feed who? The world? You know, no, you're trying to feed your baby with your body and look what your body did. That's amazing. Look what your body is doing. This is incredible. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just seeing that. And I think, I mean, there are those kind of like, I mean, you can't unpack all of that in just one short relationship with somebody, but, you know, the more we get comfortable as professionals with the way we talk, the more we can fight back against these, you know, harmful images that that these poor moms are feeling all the time. They're, they feel so inadequate and um, and body image, I think, is a very large part of that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you for that. Um, I, I think this is a huge topic, too. I mean, there are all the, each question <laughs> has a lot of stuff in there. Um, uh, but in the interest of time, we will move to our next question. Um, how do you distinguish between symptoms caused by hormonal shifts 
versus external pressures, lack of sleep, being a new parent. Annie, how do you navigate this? Yeah, I, you know, because I'm not a a, a licensed clinician, um, I can't. I really kind of can't talk to what is a, about the hormones. I will talk generally with families about there there are hormones that are happening and they're going to affect you, but. I can be most helpful in my role by really talking about the external pressures because they all have them. There isn't anybody that's solely dealing with hormonal stuff and everything else is going great. You know, they all have pressures, they all have stresses. And the phrasing that I like to use with families is I, I like to avoid talking about self-care and I like to talk with them about how are you getting people to take care of you? Who is taking care of you? And because they are not supposed to take care of themselves. And they can't and they shouldn't. And so some of them are going to need to because of their circumstances. But to really help them see that it that they're not, they're actually they're, the feelings that they have of I can't, I can't be the person that I was before I had this baby. I used to be able to get it all figured out and now I can't. That is that's normal. And that it, other people are supposed to be coming in. So like one of the things I try to throw out there is when they ask, like, what foods are good with breastfeeding? I said, any food where you didn't have to do the dishes, amazing for milk supply. I usually say that when like the partner is, is around or like grandma and that always like gets a laugh because, but it's true. Like they, other people are so important for these families and to help them see that it's not on them to make themselves feel better. Yeah, very, very true. Crystal, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, so well said, Annie. And, you know, I think there's just, we have to normalize the fact that there are a variety of things going on, like Annie was saying. I mean, we have to expect that there is going to be hormonal shifting happening after having a baby. And mom is dealing with lack of sleep. Um, and she is dealing with external pressures. I don't think we can really compartmentalize those things. We have to assume that they're all happening and really ask ourselves, how can we best support our mom during, the, during this, like, perfect storm that she's facing post postpartum. Um, and yeah, from my, from my perspective as a dietitian, I try to work with her in supporting like feeding herself. Cause like Annie said, that's a huge, I think that to be easy are now a big challenge and that can be a roadblock in how she feels physically, mentally. Um, so just trying to work with her and support her, um, in taking care of herself, but you know, helping her village come around her too. So important. Right. Um, and, and I will add to this, um, you know, the, the symptoms postpartum are, are and can be complicated. Um, how we clinically look at it is that um, about 80% of people have what's called the baby blues in the, the first couple of weeks postpartum. And it's, it's, I mean, 80% of people having this experience makes it pretty, pretty common um, where there are, you know, hormonal shifts and your body is done being pregnant and those hormones are, are leaving. And if you are, um, if you're breastfeeding, then those hormones are, are coming on board um, to support you in that. Uh, so yes, there, there are some shifts, but we can't like pop open the hood and say like, okay, this is what's doing that. Um, uh, what we do know is that this is really common and normal to have um, some, some tearfulness, some crying, some like, you know, adjusting. Um, and even sometimes like, you know, uh, like I said, feeling, feeling tearful or, or a little bit out of sorts. But if you can still pretty much um, retain, like, connected to who you are and the experience you're having, um, and it felt, feels like relatively mild, like, like a, a PMS-y type of a feeling, not like a bad PMS if you have them. Um, but um, in and around two weeks, you'll start to shift a little bit and get into a rhythm, feel a little bit more like yourself. Uh, what we do know is that if your symptoms are really intense during those first two weeks and they're lasting longer than two weeks, um, then you might be seeing uh, something else that's not just the kind of general normal transition uh, out of uh, postpartum, which lasts a while actually, but, but this, these first two weeks are critical in kind of differentiating uh, what is this kind of the kind of average experience or is there something more there? Um, and certainly if, if you're having intense symptoms that are lasting longer than two weeks, um, or if they're so intense in those first two weeks uh, that you're not feeling like yourself, then I would suggest uh, reaching out to someone. 
um, lack of sleep is going to make everything there's kind of a way to get around that part. Um, so, you know, sleep is extra, extra important um, during that time. Um, okay, okay, we can get to our, um, that kind of leads into our, our last question here um, in terms of how long it can uh, postpartum depression last. Um, and uh, what I'll say about that is that um, it, it depends on a lot of factors again. Um, uh, clinically in the, in the field, if any of the symptoms start within the first year postpartum, we consider that to be a postpartum depression or postpartum anxiety. There are several other conditions that can happen during this time. Um, uh, and uh, if left untreated, it can last a very long time. Um, and certainly in some research shows that for people who don't, who haven't had it treated um, and it's like symptoms can peak in and around four years postpartum, which is a very long time to suffer. And this is all postpartum depression, postpartum anxiety, OCD, PTSD, <clears throat> um, bipolar disorder, or postpartum psychosis. Um, these are all treatable conditions. Um, and with, if you have the right team um, of people, um, you know, it, you, you can feel better. Again, it's all um, can be complicated by like what Crystal was saying earlier, risk factors. Um, what kind of history do you have? Um, what kind of issues are um, impacting you in your current experience? Um, do you have medical conditions? Uh, like any of those other things will impact the length of time it takes to feel like yourself again. Um, but for people who get the treatment that they, um, the, the right treatment from people who um, are adequately trained, um, they feel better. They just do over time. Um, so it's, it's a great, um, there's, a, there's a lot of hope. You can feel better. Um, anything that you guys would like to add to that last question? I love that, you know, just giving them hope to say, you can feel better. It doesn't have to be like this. Um, and and just, they, they just really need to hear that. And sometimes they need to hear it from a bunch of different people before they take action. Um, and just, you know, not being afraid to stop. And in the middle of a consult, like we do in lactation, just stop and say, but how are you doing? Like, you know, you're telling me all this data on your baby, you know, every diaper, but how are you doing? And it might be that that's the first time in a long time that somebody's asked them that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, given that, Annie, I think we can move into our, our final um, thoughts. Anything that you guys want to share with the people who are listening? Um, again, like hopeful messages or things that you really want to make sure that people understand about this postpartum period of time. You can, you can continue, Annie. I, I think I would, I just really want people to understand that you can make a difference and that it doesn't take much to make a difference. So you may not have the answers to what they're going through. You might not have any answers at all, but you can communicate that presence and that when people know that someone cares about them, that does activate their own ability to, to move out of where they, to get unstuck. And like, there's, you know, there's even research about that, just that caregiver effect. So be the caregiver to every person who is coming into your professional life and start there because they just, they need us and they need us now more than ever. Absolutely, thank you. Um, Crystal, your final thoughts? Yeah, that was so beautifully said, Annie, because I think more than ever, especially now during this pandemic season of life that we're going through, moms just need hope and they just need to know that someone is there and cares about them and is willing to listen. Um, and, you know, I think creates a space for them to process whatever is coming up for them. And I think sometimes women are not used to being heard or not used to being validated. I think there's a tendency to kind of minimize what women go through, through pregnancy and postpartum, especially right now. Um, I've heard a lot of women say, yeah, I'm dealing with this, but at least my family is healthy. Like at least we're safe and comparing it to someone else's suffering and thinking like, okay, mine is not that bad compared to other people. And we just want to validate what they're feeling and what they're experiencing and hold space for them for whatever they're going through because it's complex but I love how Annie said that 
as a professional, whatever your profession is, you can make a difference. And there are some wonderful trainings out there to help the allied health professionals learn more about the complexities of postpartum and perinatal mental health and healthcare in general. And I think we can be wonderful allies for new moms as they transition into this season of motherhood. Yeah, absolutely. I'll piggyback on that um, training um, aspect for sure. It is, um, if, if you're a therapist out there or, or not a therapist, as somebody who is supporting somebody um, through any part of their reproductive period of time from conception to birth, um, there's loads of training out there now and um, thanks to COVID now online um, everywhere. Um, and I highly suggest that if you're interested in working with this population that you get specialized training. Um, it, it's absolutely important because we, we don't get this training in grad school really. It's, it's additional stuff um, and really complicated. Um, and there are so many life transitional issues and, and complications that happen during this period of time that really require um, deeper education. Um, and unfortunately, I, I have seen people go to good intention providers who didn't have the training and um, it, it just, it doesn't work out always well for the client. Um, so certainly there, there's training out there, Postpartum Support International has a, a bunch of training, um, Postpartum Stress Center and um, 2020 Mom has an online training with Postpartum Support International. And there are trainings everywhere. We'll put some of these resources um, for you in the email that gets sent out after this webinar. Um, so that you can have access to that. Um, but really, I, I do encourage anyone who's interested to go go get the training. It's absolutely worthwhile. And um, you might learn something about yourself too. <laughs> if you have ever birthed, um, there's, there's a lot to know. Um, so uh, thank you for joining us today um, on this webinar. And again, like this, this is a fantastic population to work with. There's so much room for healing um, and helping and supporting and it's a beautiful work to do um, whether you're a therapist or a doula or a midwife a lactation consultant um, any anyone really who, who's uh, supporting this population um, so as i said before there will be a follow-up email with all of these resources that were discussed here today and um, thank you annie and thank you crystal and thank you sherry i'm sorry we couldn't hear more from you today. Um, I believe there will be a, a way to reach out to um, us uh, as well in the follow-up email. So if there are questions that we didn't get to, um, more things you would like to know, um, I, I believe we're all available uh, to a certain extent uh, to be able to, to help you get those resources. Um, all right. Thanks so much for being with us.